Anyone here want a cookie? We got cookies and candy up here. Bribery. Okay, I'm going to call to order the meeting. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Littleton Zoning Board of Appeals. Astrogal is. Done just after 7.30. It's December 12, 2013. We're in room 103 of the Shattuck Street Building, 37 Great Road, Littleton, Massachusetts. And we're here tonight on a hearing on a request for modification of um, 15 Great Road LLC. 15 Great Road LLC. 15 Great Road 2 LLC on the uh, comprehensive permit for the project at 15 Great Road in Littleton, Mass. Um, the way this is going to be conducted, first of all, I would like to ask everyone here to sign in before they leave. You don't have to make a mass exodus now. We could either pass the paper around if you haven't already signed in or do so before you leave. So we have a record of who was here at the proceedings. Secondly, um, the way this works is we're going to hear from the applicant first. Uh, board members will then ask any questions that they have. Then we'll hear from town boards, departments, committees, maybe town council, maybe our consultant. And then we will ask uh, any other interested parties who are here today to make comment. Uh, in each instance, please address your questions through the chair. Everybody will have a chance to listen and uh, be heard. I would personally just like a quick show of hands as to who is here in the capacity of their respective boards or departments. I see familiar faces, and I don't know if you're here as an observer or a neighbor or an abutter or if you're here for the board or department. Okay, so then I'll identify in the room in the first row um, at the table, we have Leslie French, who's going to help make the presentation for the applicant. And then we have uh, Town Council Chris Heap, Town Council Tom Harrington, Ed Marchant, who is our consultant, and David Hale, who is the applicant or, or presenting for the applicant. And then we have... I also want to mention who the standing members are of the board and the ultimate member. Yeah. In the second row, we have Building Inspector Roland Bernier. Beside him is Keith Bergman, Town Administrator. And um, I guess the rest of the row are consultants to the applicant and uh, representatives for the applicant. And they'll be identified as they stand to speak. Uh, we have uh, also representing a board or a department, Selectman Alec McCurdy. I'm sorry, uh, to his to his right <laughs> would be Chief Scott Wojcinski, Fire Chief Scott Wojcinski. Anyone else here? I didn't. Oh, in the in the back, we have Selectman Jenna Brownson, who's standing right now. I hope you'll take a seat because you're going to get tired. And then I think that's everybody I need to recognize. Board and department. The zoning board of appeals is identified with the place cards in front of them, but I will tell you that the standing members and the regular members um, are Jeffrey Yates. Just raise your hand so they can see where I started. John Cantino, Bill Farnsworth, myself, Cheryl Gould, and Cheryl Hollinger. And then our alternate members, Alan Bell, uh, Rod Stewart, Mark Sauce here, and Patrick Joyce. Okay, would you like to get started, please, Mr. Hill? Uh, yes, for the record, I'm uh, David Hale with um, 15 Great Road LLC, and I appreciate uh, the board's time and uh, for everyone who's here tonight. Um, <clears throat> And actually, I'd like to thank Leslie and Sue in particular, who kind of worked around the clock to get all the plans and the presentation material, et cetera, together. So um, with that, um, so the, the agenda for tonight's meeting um, is a relatively long agenda. And I've, I've cut it into uh, two sections. I'm going to talk, and I'll try and get through this quickly so there's plenty of time uh, for questions from the board and from uh, the public. Uh, I'll briefly talk about the reasons for change, and then I'll talk about uh, the changes, and I'm going to talk about uh, the changes in terms of how they might affect health, safety, environmental issues, and, and um, reasons that you might have to not approve the project, which I think at the end of that, you'll see that, that there really would be no basis uh, for not approving the changes. And I, I think I'll try and make that simple. Um, and then secondly, I'll talk about the, the project 
in two parts. The rental portion, uh, we'll go through the, the buildings, the unit mix, the handicap accessible, handicap adaptable, affordable plan. Uh, we'll then switch over to the ownership portion of the project, um, which we'll emphasize will be a consumer-driven project that um, where, the, where the sales are based uh, from a model and are, are built on a build-to-suit basis so that uh, the ultimate product mix and ultimate unit designs are driven by consumer preference. Um, and I'll talk about the, the uh, we'll talk about the variety of, of products and how they um, that will offer it and how they fit a variety of demographics that are relevant in today's world. We'll talk about the, the uh, affordable units in the plan um, and how we came up with the affordable pricing uh, and then we can talk about uh, next steps as a group. Uh, and with me here this evening is also my partner Mark Brooks, uh, Lou Levine who uh, represents us, uh, Bill Murray and Sue uh, uh, from Places, uh, and our consultant on the ownership portion, Mark Gallagher, and they're all available to answer questions and, and may participate at some point. <coughs> so we're asking for uh, changes to the project. And these changes are required to make the, the project economically feasible. And economically feasible in today's world means financeable. So the, the, the things that made the prior plan not economically feasible was that the, the rental plan that we designed required outside institutional equity and debt. Uh, and we were not able to attract that. And, the, the, and we brought, and I think the neighbors can attest, they saw me drive over the property a lot of times with a lot of potential investors uh, from a variety of different uh, uh, institutions. And the, the feedback that we got was that there were too many townhomes. And the, the specific issue was that um, within 25 or 30 miles of here, there weren't townhome prop, uh, properties like ours that had recently sold. And so, you know, I dragged, you know, a dozen institutional investors, you know, guys and gals that were in their 30s and 40s who said, well, I'm going to take this to committee. And yes, there are other projects like this that one investor, Avalon, owns, but none of them have sold. And therefore, you know, it's going to be a problem. So. The other, the other uh, feedback that we got was that we had moved away from uh, units that addressed the aging demographic. We started out with our initial uh, proposal. We had uh, units serviced by an elevator. We moved away from that, and it bothered uh, the, uh, the institutional investor group. We, we're also outside the, the 128 ring. The, the, the institutional investor world uh, tends to work um, like lemmings. They, they all think that there's group think. And there's a, there's a, a, a greater interest in investing in the, the uh, urban core and in towns that touch 128. I have to say, at this stage of the cycle, that's changing and it's moving in our direction. Um, but in the last thing is, last summer, I, I hired uh, Nina Schwarzschild, who is a prominent uh, affordable housing developer and developing development consultant. And she and I put together uh, an application uh, to DHC to get subsidies for the affordable units. And uh, we, we had a meeting with uh, Kate Racer, who's the highest um, level non-appointed, not politically <coughs> appointed person at DHCD. And you know she liked the project, but at the end of the day, she said, "Look, you are your unit mix, uh, your affordable units, which is what she would be subsidizing, are too large." She said it's very unusual for uh, government subsidy programs, for instance, to uh, to subsidize garages. So she said you would have to redesign this so that garages were optional. Um, 
because the taxpayer is not going to afford that. It's not required for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't make sense for us to try and make the subsidy thing work, given, uh, given that feedback. So what we've done is we have We've essentially uh, created a project where, and, and by a project I mean uh, an entire project, uh, 40B and 40A, where each segment of the project is smaller and financeable on its own. So our ability to make this feasible is because um, we can get debt financing for an ownership portion and the rental portion and we have uh, a fairly long list of buyers that are interested and ready to purchase this portion of the project. project. So essentially we've created a format here where with internal equity and a little bit of local private equity we can finance this project. David, I'm going to ask you to put that on the easel. Turn it sideways so everyone can see it, please. Just turn it a little bit more so the audience can see it. Uh, Leslie, I know you don't have it in color, but can you just put up that page that shows that so everyone can see or it? Can you tell us what page it is on our... No, she's got it on that. It's too long. That, I don't think, is in there. No. So, David, if you would just one more time point, maybe I'll do it at the same time here. That won't, did you get it? So, here, okay, good. So, this is. So, uh, so, the, no. so, what do you, what do you want to show first? What's your point? So, my, my point is that, um, that we've, we've developed, uh, project. It's really three projects. It's 56 acres, consists of 24 40A single family homes, uh, and it will consist of 56 ownership condominiums uh, and 144 rental units. And by making each segment financeable or marketable on its own, we've created a project that is internally economically feasible. And, and that is what is driving our request for these changes. Can I go back? So, to can I ask a quick question? No, no, no. Let me finish the presentation, Just please. Clarification. Go ahead. The, what you're saying is the portion on the left, that is going to, you're proposing that be the ownership portion, is that correct? Yeah, I think if you, if you follow along, uh, I'll make all that clear. Yeah, let him go okay. through his whole presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, a, a couple other things that, that are driving us <clears throat> to this particular project design. Uh, one is that our Federal Reserve has pumped a trillion dollars of, of liquidity into the economy to reflate <coughs> the, the real estate market, and it's worked. And, um, you know, two years ago, the ownership idea on this property probably would not have worked. Today there's a pent-up demand for those units and we are very, very confident that, um, that the ownership portion will be successful. Uh, third, institutional investors, bankers like to finance traditional garden-style apartments. That in the rental world, you know, I learned the hard way, is, is what's financeable it's more cost-effective on, on a per unit basis to build. Uh, and lastly, we heard loud and clear that the demographic is aging. Institutional investors like to invest in buildings that have elevators 
that can handle people with, with uh, uh, ambulatory issues. So those are, the, so those are the reasons that we have asked for the changes that we are asking for this evening. So the changes are, from a, from a unit count basis, uh, we started out with an approved project of 190 units, of which 48 were one bed, 78 were two bed, and 64 were three bed. The changes that we're asking for are to increase the number of one beds to 66, which is a 38% increase in the number of one beds, to keep the number of two beds the same, and to reduce the number of three beds uh, from 64 to 56, which is a decrease of 13%. Uh, overall, the unit count increases by 5%, and the bedroom count decreases by 1.5%. Um, so, these changes in and of themselves in terms of changes in unit mix and, and count are not substantial changes. In the entirety, the changes we, we are asking for are substantial changes. Um, so, as I said, we, we are uh, breaking the project into an ownership portion and a rental portion. In order to do that, uh, and to make it more financeable and user friendly, particularly for the, the owner uh, and users, uh, we are going to uh, do an A&R plan and create three lots. Lots one and two uh, will be for the ownership and lot three will be for the rental. Back one, just back one. That's lot one and then lot two. And that's the rental So in, in terms of um, health, safety, and environment, uh, in terms of our, our state permit, our highway access permit is not affected. We've um, uh, sent a letter to um, uh, the Department of Transportation, and I shared that letter and we got an email back saying that uh, no, no, no issues there. Our groundwater discharge permit, we're essentially going to produce um, the same number of gallons per day, uh, and there is, there is no impact on our groundwater discharge permit. There is no impact on our conservation management permit. Our open space and conservation land is unaffected, um, and our stormwater management, uh, we expect to have less stormwater but we will need to revise our uh, order of condition, uh, and we will do so um, uh, soon, after we get through this, this process. In terms of internal design, um, uh, in terms of safety for uh, uh, safety vehicles, all the truck turns work, the hydrant locations uh, have been signed off on, uh, and we have continued with this plan to provide parking for our parents waiting uh, for the bus. In terms of uh, changes to physical waivers, um, we will need a uh, uh, waiver of frontage requirements for lots two and three, uh, which we didn't need before. Uh, our height waiver is going to go from, uh, well, increase by four feet. Uh, it, maximum height was 49 feet, uh, and we need 53 feet to accommodate um, our three garden-style uh, buildings. There will be no height waivers on lots one and two, and there are no setback waivers, period. That should say one, two, or three, and I apologize for that. So there, there will be no setback waivers. Uh, the sign waivers uh, will change, and um, that work is in progress. Uh, I think what I what I proposed in your package was uh, it looks like it was it was overkill, um, and I think as as we're quickly trying to refine our sign package, um, uh, we'll work that out uh, by next week. Um, 
So, uh, it, it, again, in terms of sign waivers, uh, we're working on the designs, but these uh, signs, which point to the signs, yes, uh, those are, are essentially very similar to what uh, was previously approved. Um, the sign at the, at the entrance, a sort of monument sign, is being redesigned to accommodate the fact that it's really going to be marketing an ownership project and a rental project. Uh, it will be about the same uh, size as uh, the previous design, <coughs> and we expect to have a complete design uh, next week. Go ahead. Oh, actually, I'm going to have to. Uh, in terms of changes in the in the site design, our original plan uh, had 48 units uh, on what will become lot lot one. And we had 88, uh, 80 units uh, on the kind of on the hill in between um, the flat and our neighbors. <coughs> so, in planning board is 307. Uh, in our new design. There will be 24 units uh, in the front, and the, the blue units are ownership units. And there will be 32 units where there were 80. And then there will be 144 units in garden-style buildings closest to Nagar Park. So. Uh, a couple other things to. Does not work at all. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to show, show um, these units right here. So we had 16 units uh, essentially along the um, sort of with the back facing 119, and we'll now have seven units where there were 16 before. So in, in terms of overall site design criteria, as um, the state regulations uh, look at it, the, the idea is that um, uh, our, oh, that our um, larger buildings, our garden-style buildings, essentially will look like they're an extension of Nagar Park. And then you, you move up the hill, and you know we have a, a ownership portion where the density is basically four units an acre, and then we have a, a vegetated buffer, and then we have the um, uh, the grist mill neighborhood. So you're kind of going from uh, the Nagog mixed use project. You're kind of extending that, going into a less dense ownership project. Uh, and that kind of offers the, the adjacent neighborhood. <coughs> so in terms of um, uh, what the project <coughs> would look like, this is kind of a, a bird's eye view from the south side of, of 119 looking at the first phase of the uh, ownership project. So in, in terms of uh, how the project fits together, um, this is a just a top-down view. It uh, okay. uh, kind of shows uh, the phases and the villages and the clustering um, and, uh, uh, and the buffer. So uh, this is a an animated shot or, or cartoon, whatever you want to call it, computer-generated shot of, uh, of the entire project uh, from kind of a bird's eye view on the south side of 119. So in terms of our neighborhood agreement, uh, there are no changes 
uh, or effects uh, uh, relative to our neighborhood agreement. So we met with all the direct abutters before we came in and made these changes. Um, and these proposed changes meet all of the uh, parameters of our existing agreement in terms of buffers, location of accessory buildings, location of larger buildings, uh, and, uh, and maximum heights. So we, we meet all of the requirements uh, of that agreement that we negotiated. In terms of um, the host community agreement, there will be no, no changes to the host community agreement. Um, section 14 of the host community agreement uh, states that in no event shall 15 Great Road be obligated to maintain more than 100 units. Uh, and that obligation, that 100 unit obligation lasts until January 1 of 2031. So in terms of um, how this project will stack up, you get to account 100% of the rental units and you get to count 25% of the ownership units. So um, uh, initially, we'll, uh, we'll have 148, 158 units in the subsidized housing inventory. Um, our pro proposed change to condition 52 would allow us to convert uh, building three and if we were to do that, uh, in the future, uh, we'd end up with 96 units counted as rentals, 12 counted as ownership in units in the garden condominium, which would be building three, and then 14 detached for 122. So uh, what we proposed in all cases uh, exceeds the requirement of the host community agreement. Now, um, just to, to review, the town is currently at 8.45% uh, in its um, subsidized housing inventory without our project. So with our project, and I, I essentially used um, uh, Keith's numbers from a presentation that uh, was done sometime last year. Uh, or early this year. Um, so the subsidized housing inventory uh, with the changes would change, so the town would be at, would have 449 units and would be at 13.04%. Um, and in 2020, uh, the denominator will change with the census. And based on, on uh, Keith's projections of how many units would be added, the town should be at about 3,894 units. And uh, this project would keep the town uh, at about 11.5%. Uh, if we were to convert in the future building three to a, to a condominium building, uh, that would dropped 12% through 2020 and to 10.6% uh, beyond 2020. So one of the, one of the other changes that um, actually we're not asking from this board but is a necessity is that uh, we will be changing subsidizing agencies. Mass development does not do home ownership. Uh, so, uh, it, it is a necessity uh, for us to move to what's called the New England Fund, which is, which is administered by Mass Housing. And the New England Fund uh, essentially is, enables us to access local banks for both the rental and the uh, ownership portion. Uh, they have to be uh, federal home loan bank banks. Um, and Mass Housing is the only one that administers that uh, program. Um, we've done this before in the reverse. In 2007, we got uh, approval for a condominium building in Tewksbury, looked at the housing market and how it was changing negatively for, for ownership, 
And uh, so we started out at Mass Housing. We switched to rental. Um, we, we got the town to uh, approve a substantial change <coughs> from ownership to rental. We went to Mass Housing Partnership, started the project, and then Bank of New England became, uh, it, uh, not Bank of New England, Bank of America in 2008 became a shaky credit, and we ended up going to Mass Development and Enterprise Bank. So we're used to doing this, this uh, switch in subsidizing agencies. Uh, but the process starts with an approval by this board, and then we will apply to Mass Housing uh, for a new site approval letter and a final approval in one process that's expedited. And we have met with um, Mass Housing. We've given them a complete presentation on the project. We've answered a lot of questions. And um, as soon as we are through with this process, um, we will deliver a giant amount of paperwork and, um, and, and, and get that project going. So uh, the requirements are that we complete the application. They do an all-inclusive review, including our budgets, our plans, our state permits. And when I say they re review the plans, they review everything about the plans, um, you know, from sustainability to um, our compliance with uh, Energy Star and the Energy Code. Uh, they will require us to have two regulatory agreements, one for the rental and, and one for the ownership. Uh, they uh, are responsible for uh, uh, the administration of all the regulations around the affordable units, their location, their design, their pricing uh, for both the sale and the rental portion of uh, the project. They will require, in order for us to get final approval, that we have debt commitments from uh, banks on for each of the rental and the sale portion, uh, and they will administer uh, uh, and review the cost allocation between the two projects, uh, as well as the cost certification. So um, just the, the specifics on the rental pro, uh, portion of the, the project, uh, there's 144 units, 66 will be one beds, 66 will be two beds, and 12 will be three beds. Uh, there will be seven handicap accessible units and there'll be 137 uh, handicap adaptable units. So what that means is that um, if, if all of the handicap units are occupied and a handicap uh, uh, user um, uh, comes to us, we can make any one of those rental units um, handicap accessible. Uh, you know, the, the walls have, uh, are, are built with all um, the blocking so that um, you can change everything you need to change to make them uh, handicap uh, accessible. So in terms of affordables, uh, there'll be 36, of which 17 will be one bed, 16 two beds, and three three beds. In terms of amenities, each building will have an elevator. They'll all have access to the pool, clubhouse, exercise room, uh, and the common rooms. Uh, we've got 36 garage spaces available for rent and um, uh, we are pricing out the, and would like to build some storage in the basement of uh, building number three uh, for rent. So just uh, that's a, a typical uh, floor plan. Um, the, and I, I don't have and I'm not going to uh, present each floor. Um, Buildings one and two are identical. Building three has a higher proportion of two bedroom units uh, and is a, is a little bit bigger. Um, that's a view of, uh, from the sky of, of what uh, the um, uh, garden buildings will look like. Uh, and um, so that is what I have to say and present about the, uh, the rental portion of the program. Um, the ownership portion of the program, as I said, uh, is designed to be consumer driven. 
uh, the idea is to put up a model uh, and to um, offer sales from that model on a build-a-suit basis. Uh, there's a, a variety of product types and um, we fully expect that uh, we'll be serving uh, a lot of empty nesters, downsizers, we'll also serve families and, uh, and first-time home buyers. The unit mix will be 44 three beds with 11 affordable and 12 two beds with three affordables. Um, this is just a, uh, the, the concept here is there's a, uh, a village theme. Uh, so the, the units are kind of uh, clustered and, and identified uh, by a village. So again, you can see there's a, there's a couple clusters in the in the in the uh, first phase, uh, and there's a number of clusters in the in the second phase. Um, in terms of the unit types, uh, I'm going to kind of go through them quickly. Some of the units um, uh, will be for sale as affordable or market units, uh, and that is true with uh, both the Pesto and the Fox Club. And the Nora Abbey. Uh, this unit we, we added, um, it, it is a, a unit that is available is either a market or affordable, but um, we thought it made sense to have uh, uh, a market, well, and an affordable unit that work for for uh, an empty nester who wants a first floor master. And this this unit has a uh, first floor master. Uh, so I have a handout that just describes how the pricing is determined for the affordable units. We had a, it just didn't come on the screen. So the, the ultimate pricing is, is uh, more or less determined and approved by Mass Housing, um, and it's formula driven. So um, you start with the, uh, the household size, and for a two bedroom, the household size <coughs> is deemed to be three people. For a three bedroom, uh, it's deemed to be four people. So you, you look at the 80% median income uh, for, uh, for the Boston market, for a two bedroom, uh, for yeah, for a three person household, it's six sixty thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. For a four bedroom household, it's sixty seven three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, uh, the affordable pricing is uh, determined based on thirty percent of someone's income going to housing, uh, except they deduct a ten percent cushion. And so you come, come up with um, uh, a gross available after the cushion. You have to take out a condo fee, estimated utilities, insurance at $4 a thousand, uh, and, and taxes. And, um, and then you come up with, geez, you know, what's available for the monthly mortgage payment. And at a 30-year mortgage at a four and three quarter interest rate, uh, you, you, and a 10% down payment, you, you end up at 172,000. We used 170 in our, our numbers um, for a two bedroom and 186. We used 185. Those numbers will change as time progresses, and uh, and the inputs change. That's a standard formula. So, quick question. Ownership pricing, but do you have 
speak up. Go ahead. On here, you have uh, affordable housing pricing. And down on one of the items is gross rent. Yeah. So explain that, please. Uh, yeah, I stole this chart from. Uh, I'm the president of Concord Housing Development Corporation, and um, a consultant who consults with us put these charts together. You can use them for for rent or for sale, and I filled in the, the mortgage portion. So it should say gross rent. Uh, it should say uh, gross available for mortgage, and that's it. So that's a typo. So I'm taking a shortcut. Thank you. So just to recap, because not everyone had the handout, um, after doing the calculations, it looks like an affordable uh, two-bedroom uh, will be approximately $173,000, and an affordable three-bedroom price will be approximately $186,000. Those numbers are subject to change because the state doesn't set the price. It's the state that sets the price, and the applicant has to deliver the up-to-the-minute numbers that would be the interest rate at the time, the uh, condo fee that's actually uh, found to happen, the taxes at the time. So these numbers are fluctuate a little bit, but um, that's where he's at now. And all of these are single family detached condos? Correct. Okay. So in, in, in terms of um, uh, affordable unit locations, um, this is the plan that we showed uh, mass housing, uh, and they seem to be fine with the plan. The plan is driven uh, by some, to some extent by uh, topography uh, and spacing and, uh, and whatnot. So they are uh, spread around um, the project as is the requirement, and uh, mass housing is satisfied with this one. What do you have the number of units on lot one, please? Uh, uh, total number of units? 24. Three, four, five, six, so that would be six of 24 in, in the basement. Okay. And there, are, yeah. Okay. So, um, in terms of, in terms of um, ownership user options, again, these, these, uh, units will be sold, both actually affordable and market, uh, will be on a build-to-suit basis. So uh, people will be able to take the basic plan and they'll be able to add, potentially add a garage bay or bays. They'll be able to uh, add or finish a basement. Uh, they may want to add a deck or a th three-season room uh, or expand a dormer. Um, Essentially, any addition that won't change the deed restricted uh, unit bed bedroom count. Most of the plans you showed us for the affordable looked like they had garages under or were integral to the plan. Some of them, uh, some of them will, and some of them won't. I think it's about half and half. And it just there's some. If it is in a, a spot where there's grade so that there needs to be a basement or garage, it has one. If it's on a spot where there's ledge, there's not going to be a garage or a basement. So it, it depends on where it is on the plan. And actually we have a chart, which I will hand out uh, in a minute, that uh, explains that in a little bit more detail. So, and actually that is the chart. Um, I put it on the screen because to show uh, <coughs> you might want to explain this one. I guess we need to share them. Um, oh, okay. Council, did you get one? So, um, 
it goes over to the second page. You might want to rip it apart because I didn't have time to put a header on the second page. What's that? <laughs> this takes a lot of coordination, which I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So, um, could I, um, I, let me skip this for a minute if you don't mind. Basically what's been ha passed out and what's on the screen that you can't see from there, because I can't see it from here, is a uh, chart that identifies all 56 units and uh, where they're located and whether there's uh, an ability to put a foundation or not, and then compares by type of home, which home can have a foundation and which can't. And rather than take the time now to go through all of that, because I would rather see the overview um, and get bogged down in this later when we start talking about affordability and features and whether they look like each other or not. So that, that's fine. let's go through. Thank you for the chart. Okay. So uh, the chart is designed to uh, relate to an envelope plan. So um, at, at Ed's suggestion, and this could have come out a little darker. Could you put it up on the resource list? David, do you want to put some on the table? No, that's good. So we're okay. We can see it on okay. the screen. Thank you. So the, the, the concept here is that um, although uh, we've punched a ton of holes and, and done a bunch of drilling to determine where ledge is, um, it, it's impossible to lay out uh, one of these projects and know for sure uh, where ledge is going to be. So when you actually start building in the field, you may want to turn some of these units, um, and it, you uh, you may want to shift them a little bit. So, and if if uh, if somebody wants uh, a deck, <coughs> for a pre-season porch, or they uh, they're buying a base unit that that uh, didn't have a garage, and they want garage bays, um, what we've done is we've created a a, a building envelope that is bigger than the actual unit that's shown on the plan. And again, this is going to be a consumer-driven project, so we've taken a wild guess as to how many of which type of unit will actually be sold. But my crystal ball is not that good. And so where we have uh, a laughing tiger, somebody may want Give me another name. Pasta. Yeah, whatever. And it's going to have different dimensions, and therefore, um, we've we've created a development envelope that would, would accommodate that. You can see that um, some of them have more flexibility uh, than others, and this chart um, basically enumerates uh, a unit number, and it describes which of the units could fit within that development envelope and what options they could have if somebody chose that unit to go in that location. And we, in the, um, what we passed out, the, uh, the numbers that are in red are where the affordable units were. And it also, you know, so you can see um, whether there's a basement or a walkout or whatever. So, um, so uh, that really ends my presentation. And I'm happy to uh, answer or have any of my team answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Bless you. Board members, first please. Questions? Hi. Bill. One of the slides you have up, you're saying that you needed the ZBA approval, and you're going to go to Mass Housing um, to obtain a site approval letter. Correct. Now, under the regular 40B, 
wasn't it the other way around? The site approval letter first, and then come to us. Well, we already have a site approval letter, okay. and and the state has approved uh, uh, the site. Uh, so this is a, a formality, uh, and uh, when when you sw switch subsidizing agencies, which happens frequently, mm -hmm. uh, this is the protocol that they use, and it's you know it's it's a lot of work for them, and what they said and they told me this before is you know go go get your changes so that when you come to us it's an expedited process you know exactly what the, your decision is and it will be quicker easier uh, for us to uh, to expedite that I've, I've, I've done it before that's how we did it. questions boy um, with the market driven uh, ownership section. How will you deal with the affordables? Will you? Will someone be approved in a lottery and then come to you and say, "I want this model," or are you going to build them and then put them in a lottery? Um, no, we'll have a lottery at the beginning of each phase, and um, and uh, you know we'll say you know here are the locations, and you can have whatever units happen to fit on that location. So if, if you know, uh, somebody 65, uh, you know, wants a, a first floor master, they can have that if it fits on that location as opposed to the Fox Clubs, which, which is a colonial style, where the bedrooms are upstairs. My only concern about that has been historically um, qualified applicants during the lottery phase frequently can no longer be qualified three or four months later or have the, when the building is done. So how do you account for that? Well, typically in these projects, you, you have a lottery and you sell you know, one or two units, and then all of the rest of the units are sold um, really on a, by sort of a broker. Um, and so I don't think that would be an issue. Still affordable, but you're saying that the lottery does, the lottery gets undersubscribed. The lottery will be undersubscribed. Yeah, that's and, what we yeah, found too. Yeah. I, I've got two questions to talk about this. First of all, for the affordable unit that goes to somebody who buys it, how is it going to be written that they cannot turn around and resell it or rent it? That's handled. That's this handled will by be DOCD. subject to standard deed rider that's dictated by uh, mass housing. And it, it's all of the affordable uh, agencies use the same deed rider today. And just for the for the benefit of the board, when the lottery price is established, there is a uh, percentage that the state applies. That price is X percent of fair market value at that time and place. So when the unit is resold, the limit on what that affordable person can sell it for is the same percent uh, it established by the state. Of what the then market price is, so they their their profit is limited well, what, and it's what's affordable. What's the given to you? It's deed. It's, it's, it's a deed restricted. It's because I, I do know of a couple of situations where forty B's were in an affordable unit bought and resold three times. The third time was triple the price of the original. Mr. So, Rashan, so let, let my consultant speak on this. Uh, this obviously is an important issue for the state, and all the agencies have agreed upon a universal deed writer. That deed rider is important because it stipulates the terms for any resale. They've actually changed, Sherry, the uh, methodology for determining the resale price, and now it's geared off any increase in the allowable income. What they found with the discount method is that if market prices went up significantly, that discount times the market price might result in a sales price that is not affordable. So now they just take a look at the increase. So buyers can, uh, assuming incomes <coughs> increase, enjoy a modest, a modest um, gain on the sale. But um, this is all recorded. Occasionally, um, lawyers will, not, bank lawyers will not do a check, a proper title check, and provide financing for for a mortgage, and they're at risk on that. Follow up to that. You had on one of your slides that 
there are options. And they, they applied to the affordable units as well. So if somebody qualifies, uh, first of all, do they have the options for adding a full finished basement and a garage to sunroom, whatever else, do they apply to the affordables? Uh, no, not, not really because um, uh, because there are options and they're available at a price. And that price would, would increase the price of that unit beyond the affordable range. All right, so the, the option will be chosen before the affordable price is set. No. No. There's a, it's difficult, if you think about it, the sale price is based upon the maximum allowable sales price. If you then add options to it, it's unlikely that you're going to recover, able to recover the cost of those options. If you want to put in a, a new kitchen, nobody's going to prevent you from putting in a new kitchen, but your sales price is restricted. So if you don't expect to stay there a very long time to amortize those costs, uh, you're, you're really not making a very good investment as an affordable home owner. But um, off of this, um, isn't one of the goals of the affordable housing is that the mm -hmm. units that are affordable should not be different from the non-affordable units, should not stand out in any way as different and should be part of the community? In terms of basic design and curb um, view, uh, they should not be distinguishable from the market rate units. The interior finishes could be different. If you're doing granite countertops in a market rate unit, you don't have to do granite countertops. But sort of the, the, the guts of the building should be similar. We've had this discussion in the past on some other for sale projects here in Littleton. The for sale, for, for example, in his first section, all of the units that are affordable are listed to have only crawl spaces. Um, not full, full basements. Is you're telling me that's well, not a problem with that, with the goals of the housing authority? No. That's that's not true. Um, it is certainly for six, nine, ten, twelve, so sixteen, I, right, so seventeen. For, for about half of the units, uh, it is true, and then some of them will have um, a garage under, and some of them will have uh, walkout condition. Some of them will have basements, and, and again, it's... I was talking about your first phase here, uh, the A, what you called A. Yeah, so there's more ledge there. So I guess is what you'd like to do, and I, I looked at the old Littleton Village on the Common comprehensive permit, and there were some units, not all units, had basements on that. I think what the board ultimate, the agreement or the decision the board reached is that the percentage of units with basements will be similar for the market rate units and the affordable units, and it was prorated that way. But I think probably what needs to be done, this is the first time the boards receive this information, I think you really have to take a look at this, take a look at the site plan, take a look at the models, because there's, there are significant differences among these models. Um, and sort of after you've had a chance to take a look at that, um, you know that's an interest of mine. I'll be taking a look at it. Um, and I think then you make a decision. But I would argue it's your decision. It's not Mass Housing's decision. Okay. I, I would argue the opposite. Thank yeah. you. Uh, all right. Now, I, other questions? Can I yes. move on? Sure. You have an order of, what order are you planning to build these phases in? Do you have a particular order in mind? Are you going to build all of them at once? You're going to do A, B, C? CBA? Um, we'll probably do two phases. And uh, we're debating uh, whether it's the front section or the rear section that goes first. And I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure uh, which one will go first. There's advantages logistically to both. OK. And um, it looks like you're from one of your slides, it looks like you show access onto Nagoth Park. You want to put a sign down there? Uh, there's, there's a, uh, a walking path. A wa oh, the sign's for the walking path. The sign is because 
there's 380 apartment dwellers that drive by every day. And when we have a unit available, I'd like them to know. Okay. So it's a, it's I, a commercial. I understand interest. that. And there's also, you know, thousands of people that work in the park. Okay. Patrick. How many uh, garages are you eliminating from this whole project? Garages. Patrick, when you say eliminating, eliminating from the prior plan? The, yes. Or do you mean out of all these homes, how many will not have garages? That's right. Okay. Now, I think if it's this current <clears throat> version, how many homes will not have any garages? Um, well, in the apartments, uh, we'll have, there's 144 apartments, and we'll have 36 garage spaces that are available to rent. And that's kind of an industry standard. If you have more than that, you find you have vacancy uh, amongst your garage base. Um, in terms of the uh, ownership portion, Mark, do you have I don't any? know the number off the top of my head. I mean, the garages are optional. <clears throat> it would be very difficult to predict because we're going to build to suit. That's the market uh, plan. So. If somebody came in, as an example, and everybody picked a pesto, there is no garage. But most of your plans appear that the garages are integral to the home. There are some. With, with bedrooms over. Most of them look that way. So in reality, I think your answer is um, none of the affordables have garages planned unless the odd chance somebody picked that one Nora Abbey there that has the garage under. But that garage under doesn't work in the first phase because he said he's on ledge. So, yeah, so there'll um, be no garages on the affordables in the first phase the according to what he's showing us. What the plan he has says that there's only crawl spaces yeah. in the uh, But, but, but the affordables. Um, okay, so but we're, we're going down between board rooms okay. and through the chip. Um, so this little building, the carriage house. Right hand side. Right hand side. That is a garage, um, and the, uh, the affordable units in that first bay will get a space in that garage. How many bays are in that garage? Six. So what you're saying is six affordable units will have a bay in that garage. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that these. These units here will each get a unit in, in this You're garage. saying 9 and 10. Is that correct? The ones that are in that little plot? Yes. That's 9 and 10. So two affordable units in that plot in that will get a garage. We'll, we'll get a garage. And there's only two, two affordable units in that plot. Um, and there's four units in phase one that won't get a garage. Four affordable units in phase one won't get a garage. Correct. Okay. And in the, in the rear, um, what is the affordable location plan? 1617. So, since this seems to work better, I don't know that. Um, my recollection is that uh, this unit has a garage. Well, it says on your plan here that uh, 42, 43, 44, and 46 don't have garages. That's four out of six. Uh, four out of seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four out of eight don't have garages. But a couple of them will have full basements with walkout basements. Right. Because you around the corner go up the hill. Right. So, you know, since this will be built on a build to suit basis, including the affordable units, um, until the end of the project, uh, you know, people should have some choice as to about as a, in terms of which of those features are, are really important. No, because the affordable folks don't have that choice because they you price out very quickly if we don't include them in the base. No, what I'm you, what already, I'm, you already made that statement earlier. What I'm saying is that you know if if a garage is really important and there's a location there where that location is going to have a unit uh, on it with a garage then they can choose that. If, if a basement is more important to them and 
there's a, there's a location available where that unit is going to have a basement, then they can choose that. And so they will have some choice near the end of the process that those choices will be somewhat limited. Does that answer your question, Petra? Can I just ask you about, I still don't understand this. Every single home have a driveway so that the, with, a, with or without a garage, if I live there, I can get off the street and into my yard. Uh, it looks like it. Uh, actually, in this cluster here. Morning glory. The mor morning glory cluster. Um, those, those units uh, have a carriage house for garage, and there are parking spaces here and here. And, and those units all face in the courtyard, no graphics. And they don't have, they don't have driveways behind the units. So this is a, uh, a modern concept that is very popular across the country. Uh, it's a uh, little village. One was just built in Concord. The developer's a friend of mine. I thought he was completely out of his mind, and he sold all the units in the worst housing market that we've seen in decades. And people are really happy living there. So I, I guess uh, what I would ask you is to suspend your personal taste, because this isn't about your personal taste. Um, and you know, this is a, a market-driven project, and uh, it's a build to suit project. And you know, if we're wrong about market taste, you know, we'll, we'll pay the price. But that's, um, that's our design. Of the eight units that don't seem to have driveways, four of them are affordable. And out of and that's a high percentage of this total of a I, I think we I think when we get there we need to address the location yeah. of the affordables is what I'm saying. And I think we as Mr. Marshant said, we need to review okay. a lot of this. So let's move on to other questions not having to do with the style of units. Because there's plenty of meat here to talk about. There certainly is. We, we, we have before us um, a presentation for <coughs> a substantial change to the existing comprehensive permit. Mm -hmm. Does any, can I, a board member satisfied to let me open it up? I'll come back to you if you have more questions. But now I'd like to open it up to department heads and chairs. They've been patient. Can we start one? with Mr. Marshall? Start. He does, he's, 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 any department heads and chairs want to speak to this? Board board members? No. Okay, how about anybody else in the audience? Uh, in the rear. I can't see you from, I know you, but I can't Robin see you. Robin Bigelow, leg away. The large complex rental units, 54 feet high, 53 feet high. How many stories is that? Four. Anyone else? Following up on the 53 foot height, four stories, ceiling heights are eight feet. I mean, with the plans, there were no sections. So, can you tell us why, you, how it comes out to 53 feet? Just explain that. Um, yeah, each, uh, I think the ceilings are 8-3, I mean, which, is, which is a little uh, lower than standard. Um, and um, so our architect designed it uh, so that with the pitch of the roof, you get to 53 feet. So the pitch of the roof is a little bit lower than it normally would be. Okay, I'll take a minute to read into the record the comments that came. It's curious to me that we did not receive any formal comments from any boards or departments about this request for substantial change or the plans. The plans have been uh, submitted around to all the boards and the departments, and we had a short presentation approximately a week ago um, where I think almost everyone was represented. and everyone was asked to submit in writing any comments. So I was curious that none three came Three days here. ago. Pardon? That was three days ago. 
That's it. Yeah. One day. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how time flies when you have a fun. Um, so I'm certain that we will have to go another meeting anyway, and people could still, uh, boards could still have a chance to make their comments. But generally, um, the impression to this change was favorable. There's a few things I'll speak to in a minute. This is a letter from an abutter. Um, I'm sorry, not an abutter. Her name is Megan Rank, and she's from Six Green Needles Road. It's a resident. Dear Mr. Bergman, Board of Selectmen, and members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, I am unable to make tonight's meeting regarding proposed changes with the 40B on Great Road. I am discouraged to learn that the developer wants to lose the clause keeping the unit's rentals in perpetuity. It is now even more clear that the developer has no desire to actually provide affordable housing in the town of Littleton. This is an outright attempt to use the rules of 40B to circumvent our zoning for the present while maximizing profit and diminishing the actual affordable housing for the future. Say no. Avalon Acton has high vacancies. We have other failed 40B projects in town. This developer is getting nervous. Please say no. Let us work towards creating a better plan for affordable housing, perhaps requiring all new developments to include affordable housing. People would then have a real chance at real home in a neighborhood. Thank you for your time. We also received a letter from town council which simply um, explains the timetables for keeping the SHI count. And Tom, I'd like you to speak to that rather than reading the letter out loud. Why don't you just tell the board so we're all familiar with the timetables. Okay, so, so just so that you're all aware, as you know, a major goal that was achieved with this project was getting Littleton over its 10% uh, subsidized housing inventory number. So just to keep in mind, not to dictate how you run your show, but to keep in mind, the permit um, uh, became effective last year on February 21st. So that was kind of the first day that we were over our 10%. The permit number is good for a year. So if we don't issue a building permit on a significant number of the units before February 21st, we're going to fall back off um, or we're going to fall below our 10% number. So just kind of working backwards, um, there's a 20-day appeal period that we need to figure in. So in, in this case, you would want to make your decision if, if you're concerned about that number on or before January 31st, then we have the 20-day appeal period. Um, and if the building permit is issued, um, applied for, <coughs> and issued in a timely basis before February 21st will stay above our 10% number. Even if we issue the, per, the changes by the 31st, there's no guarantee that the per building permit will be pulled by the 21st, is there? There's no guarantee, no. So we're ho hopefully we, we're all so working. We have, we have no way to control this, really. We don't. Okay, thank we just you. hope that we're all working in good faith towards the common Well, we thought the building permit would have been pulled by now, too, when we issued the permit. Now, I also want to speak to the overall picture here. Mm -hmm. There is a significant change to the rental and perpetuity clause, as the uh, resident uh, commented. There is, however, um, some benefit in losing some three bedrooms and some benefit, I, I think tremendous benefit, in getting three elevated buildings um, for a different population um, and what I think is a great need in this community. So those are the things we're weighing here. As I see it, the developer has made a very good effort to keep our SHI where we wanted it to be under the host community agreement through 2030. Um, I, I'm, I just did a quick math on this, though, and we projected, Keith, we projected the 2020 census numbers based on historic building, and That's this project alone could add 124 units um, 
if it's built out by the 2020 census. We, we, we had factored that factored as well, that yes. But well, what about, in, and there are some large developments coming online. I think he's factored that in. That's all I wanted to check. Yeah, and, and those numbers were, were uh, codified in the um, host community agreement that the selectmen entered into. Basically, it was backing up. It's where we came up with the, with the figure of at least 100 units from this development need to be countable on the subsidized housing inventory. It doesn't mean that the town, it doesn't relieve the town of any obligation to continue to pursue affordable housing goals. It, uh, it gives us some breathing room uh, if we can stay above 10 percent, uh, but uh, it, it uh, only, you know, it certainly obligates the town to continue to work on affordable housing, but knowing that at least the share that's that comes from this development will be there for us to to count on to keep us above ten percent. There could be other units, for example, not this one. There might be other units on the inventory that fall off for one reason or another. We need to be proactive in making sure that those other units and new units uh, come on board. That's that's why we're we're preparing to update our housing production plan so that we have a a strategy as a community uh, to to address affordable housing needs. And assuming that the concept, I, I like to call it a PUD, it, in other areas of the country they call these, they look like planned unit developments. Mm -hmm. They're clusters sitting together and it's a different kind of living style than we're used to in Littleton. Assuming that it, it gains favor, it takes off here, mm -hmm. this will not stop us, even though we're above the SHI, this will not stop us from entertaining another development that might be a smaller, more more benign, but also a smart sense of development for a, a smaller lot, let's say, right? We could certainly do that under so-called friendly 40 Bs, uh, it, but what it, what it does do if we stay above 10 percent, it puts the community in the driver's seat in saying, where would we like to see those those units? And that's, you know, that's what we're working on. So again, I'm, I'm really surprised that there's not more uh, voices being heard. I don't want to monopolize, but I want to, please, Alec, I don't want to hear another voice. <laughs> uh, I have a question, I guess it's for the town council. Um, how many building permits have to be issued before the deadline date before we drop off the 10%? Yeah, I believe it's 54. 54. So then I would generally throw out the question um, because you, you brought this up that, you know, we have to move along in an expeditious manner in order to keep our 10 percent. But the fact of the matter is keeping the 10 percent past February is not realistic. That's too many building permits. That's not going to happen. It's just just like, let the applicant me. answer. Yeah. Up first. So, certification of the building so, permits. Um, not 54 building permit, but building permit for, for 54, 54 units. units. Yes. They do a building permit for one pilot building. That's multiple units. That's 48 units right there. Right. So buildings one and buildings two are identical. So to the extent that we can get it in gear, I think we have a relatively good chance of, of pull, pulling building permits for those two buildings, which would be 96 units, uh, which solves your issue by the February date? By the February day, and you know, I'm I don't personally care about the February day, uh, but uh, we sure do. Uh, but you know, we're willing to put our oar in the water. But you have to understand that that uh, the construction drawings for those two identical buildings, it's a six-figure plus uh, expense. I'm not going to, you know, sign the order to do that until this board says, "Go ahead." And for clarification, so, and I understand and they don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And it'll cost more money because I'm going to have to have my architects and engineers work overtime, work through holiday time, etc. So it's a relatively expensive proposition. And I don't think we should be in a position where, quite frankly. We are being forced to accept changes. I mean, this is a very, the rental units and the rental buildings, four-story rental buildings, are a very significant change from what we approved. Um, it's a huge change, and it's 
not at all what we worked towards for over a year. And to suddenly be having a gun to our head and, and looking at that deadline as a gun to our head to approve three four-story buildings with 48 units of, into them doesn't make sense. It, it just, I mean, that's, it, it's I, not reasonable. I, I agree. Do, do you mind if I just respond to that? Please. So, um, I'm, I'm not putting a gun to your head. February 21st, I, you know, I, I don't really care. But what I will tell you is that, um, is that my partner's pockets are uh, lighter because I used poor judgment in, um, in negotiating an approved plan that wasn't feasible. And, and these changes make the project economically feasible. So, so what I'm saying is, and I think you should take comfort in the fact that the criteria by which you can say, I don't want this, is health, safety, environment. It, you know, this is an economically feasible project. That wasn't. I spent, and my company and my partners spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars Mr. on Hale, plans. That you wasted almost Cheryl, over a let year. Him finish, please. And, and Cheryl, we, let him we tried in good faith. I believed in that plan. I told myself that plan was going to work. It didn't. I've been told by a lot of institutional investors and bankers that the plan just didn't work and that what they want to invest in and what's economically feasible for a rental project is exactly what I just proposed. And so that's what's economically feasible. That's it. That's yeah. what works. It works for the for yeah, like respond. Okay. You Fine. wasted over a year of our time. It is your job and your business to know what is economically feasible. For you to now stand here and tell and have us try to feel bad for you because you wasted hundreds of thousands don't of feel dollars. Bad for me. I'm just no, don't interrupt Mr. me. Hale, don't interrupt you me. you you complain of wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars and taking money out of your partner's pockets. You wasted hundreds of hours of our time. We're volunteers and our time is valuable to us too. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, it doesn't sound like you do. And whether you're putting the gun to our heads or not, there's a gun to our heads now. And that's not acceptable in my opinion. And I'm not going to look at it as a gun to our heads. The fact that we are, I'm not going to be bulldozed into approving four-story, 48-unit buildings which are not in as safe or as good character or as appealing as what we did approve and what we worked so hard to get to. So we're going to have to look at some of this. And it's, it's not... That's, 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 your, that's your prerogative, and I think, um, you know, I feel bad about the time uh, that was spent by, by all of us, but I, I, I will tell you that I recently went, and I frequently go to symposiums, and uh, Steve Samuels, who is doing literally a billion dollars of, of development in Boston in lots of different places, made the comment that in the last 10 years, every single major project he's done, by the time he actually spent the two to three years to get it approved, the market had changed. And in every single case, he had to go back and make changes and get it reapproved. In every single case. I know different. This is hugely significant change to the rental part. You know, the, the townhouses and the owner so parts that you're talking stop, about. When, stop a minute, please. When? We are here because the board voted this is a substantial change. Right. We, he's here because the board voted it's a substantial change. There's no gun to anybody's head. I asked town council to express to the board what the timetables are, not telling us that we have any obligation to meet those timetables. Mr. Hale has no real incentive to pull permits by February 21 because he has his approvals good for three years. He really can wait and not pull permits for three solid years. So he's not putting any gun to this board's head. We as a community need to make a determination if we are going to try to all work in good faith to try to hold the SHI count or not. And it's as simple as that. Nobody feels that we have to force a decision that is unliked by uh, the majority or the board or the process. We don't have to force a decision to, to hold our SHI. We have to decide as a community whether to do that or not. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Chris Simone, Charles Ridge. Just two quick questions um, to the chair for town council. Are there any other mechanisms by which the February 21st timing imperative, other than the 20-day period, can be extended to provide some breathing room for this process? Or have we exhausted those and we already discussed them? That's a very good question, council. Not that I know of. But I would well, say emphatically no. No. And there was discussion, uh, Mr. DeSimone, for you and for others. We have had discussion with the applicant, with his council, with our council, with Ed Marchant, about whether maybe pulling a foundation permit would suffice, maybe whether there's a extension period. We could count a date different than the February 21st date. And I think Keith went to a symposium on it where well, he testified to look well, for better. Well, you know, in fact, the, the, the answer to the question, isn't there any other way to do it? Well, we, if we could get the legislature to change state law, then we would have more than 12 months from the date that you issue your decision to the date that the units fall off, the building permit isn't pulled by the developer. Um, town meeting petitioned the legislature in November to change, to so change the law. Uh, following the lead of some other communities that have done the same thing. The legislature has not passed any of those bills. And you think they will by February? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, un it's unlikely. Well, you know, the House, the House of, uh, of Representatives just passed a two-year budget deal, so I suppose anything's possible. But, uh, Thank you. I doubt it. And, and Mr. DeSimone, you had a second question. Sure. Um, the, has the applicant visited with the school committee, or do they plan to, to to review what, if any, impact this has on on the schools? While they're they're no, under no obligation, given that that's not a criteria with respect to this approval, it would be good information for us to have. Uh, Mr. Hill. Yeah. So the, the, uh, we we did meet with um, the school department uh, at the beginning of the process. We have not since we changed the. Um, uh, the design and my sense is with more three bedrooms and uh, more one bedrooms and fewer three bedrooms that you know the, the impact is likely to be diminished but it it's it's beyond my control in any in any event I mean I and I, I I'm in this position uh, uh, in the town of Concord our uh, the town's nonprofit group is um, has been given a piece of land, uh, 12 acres uh, off Winthrop Street. And, you know, it's deed restricted. It has to be used for affordable housing. And, you know, it's a nonprofit volunteer thing, and, and people still, you know, bring up the school issue and, and don't want to uh, educate kids in, from affordable units. And I think it's unfortunate. It doesn't matter if you're in a for profit position or non nonprofit, you get the same. Same type of stuff. So Mr. Hill, I don't think that was the question. I think the oh, question that, is. Thank you. Uh, that was insulting. Thank answer. you very much. That was, yeah, that was okay, a little insulting. Right. He, he I think a question somebody else must have asked him. I think the question. Like I think the question is fairly: Is it likely to increase the number of children in the school if units are for sale rather than for rent? And it's as simple as that, regardless of the affordability, affordability component. Um, but thank you for your answer. Yes, uh, actually, can I hold you one second? Mr. McCurdy's hand was up first, and then yours was next. Pardon me. I, I think in asking my question, the, the point is that uh, um, there's a lot to do here. You know, and I'm not in your position. I'm glad I'm not in your position. But um, you know, it's all well and good he has to come forward because of the economic condition. But we, as you know, the people who are serving this town, have to do what's best for this town. And I don't think, and this is my opinion, I don't think it's realistic to think we're going to get through this process before we fall off the 10% chart. And I, I don't think we should um, rush to do that. And only out of being realistic about what time we have, what we have to go through for holidays, and all the other things. We don't even have input from boards and committees yet to look at. Uh, many of these boards haven't had a chance to meet yet, and um, we just have to face the fact that we may well fall off the 10%. Possibly. And, and also, it may be that we'll fall off the 10% and there's no one in the pipeline who can come in fast enough 
to slip another project in too before agree, we get back on the 10 percent so you're right um, well, no i promised this woman okay. and now i'll come back to you Patricia Wotasic, 86 gross mill that essentially is my question what happens february 22nd i mean is somebody ready to hand in plans we know of no one ready to hand in plans so, and as a practical matter they have to get a site approval letter yeah. we have no indication that there's anybody seeking that they frequently try to come before the Board of Selectmen first. We have no indication that anyone's there doing that. And then we have to review the application informally. So you're right, we would have a good 30-day lead time before the next application can really come on formally. So that's a good question, too. Mr. Bell. But our window of vulnerability would be two years, essentially. Is that correct? If they no. have a three-year three permit, well, if they have a three-year <laughs> permit, and if in February um, that we're now vulnerable because the housing units drop off because they haven't pulled a permit and they've got two years so they're in play for two years but we're vulnerable for two years to another 200 unit no it was vulnerable till they pulled the permits when right. they could wait up to two years or to pull the yeah, permits or, or, or longer if they ultimately decide they can't go forward and no one else has come forward then we're permanently below 10 percent because Mr. Marshall let me let me try to explain uh, the critical date is 12 months. If building permits had not pulled within 12 months of the time the comprehensive permit was final, the units drop until such time that they pull a permit. The next date that you have to be concerned about is if more than 18 months expire between the issuance of the building permit and the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, you lose the permit. So one of the boards, one of the questions the board wants to ask the applicant is, oh, how soon do you expect to be able to complete the building and pull that certificate of occupancy? So you mean even if we were to rush and manage to get Mr. Hale to agree to pull, say, two building permits for buildings one and two, if he didn't have an occupancy permit within, within six months, months of 18, that, 18, 18, 18 months, months of that, right? Which is certainly enough time if to know. build two of those apartment buildings. I just want to uh, reiterate what the chair said. For 40 Bs, you have to get a project eligibility letter. In order to get a project eligibility letter, the subsidizing agency gives a town 30 days to submit comments. So you will always be aware that another project is in the works. It's also very common if you ask for a two-week extension that you could get a two-week extension to that. So it gives you a 45-day period to make some moves. Um, In your experience, have there been other towns in this position and has someone slipped in and tried to use, you know, to get in front in line? No, I've had experience where towns have been very deliberate for example, recently in Norwood, to get a housing production plan approved prior to the issuance of a comprehensive permit by one day, issue the comprehensive permit in advance of another development that they knew was in the works, that had been in open discussions with the town. Where they were below 10 percent. And they were below 10 percent. So what they got, they wanted to get that two-year moratorium. What you have to remember is you're in a good position because this is going to get you to 10 percent. Once you're at 10 percent, as stated previously, you can deny any project because you've met local needs. You can also approve any project, but you have the leverage. Mr. Bergman, does I know that you are working on a, plan, a housing development plan for the town of Littleton. Yes. How close are we to getting that approved? Getting that? A, year, a year away. Well, I, I met with the state housing officials. There's no expedited procedure for updating our plan. We're contracting with the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council to update our uh, housing production plan, it's called, and that it's it, it will be a nine-month process uh, uh, for its completion. So, you know, and then the town September, has to vote so, on September. it? September. But, but the but Ed, Ed's point was, and the comparison with the other community, if if the if the community were below ten percent, then um, 
then having the housing production plan in place would allow you to count the units in the, uh, having that plan in place first would then allow you to count your, your newly created units <coughs> From, a, from an applicant uh, because uh, uh, because the because the housing production plan only lets you count new units that you've never approved before but can I, I try to explain yeah, that yeah uh, there's no urgency right now for the town to have an approved housing production plan right. in terms of protecting yourself in regard to future 40 B's it's critical for the town I was working in Norwood to have an approved housing production plan because the project it approved created more than one percent of the housing units necessary. Therefore, if you do that and you have an approved housing production plan, you get a two-year grace period during which you could deny any comprehensive permit and the applicant would not have the right to appeal. So Here you're going to get it. You're going to get to ten percent if this project modification is approved. So let's uh, let's back and up. And the building permits are pulled, and the number oh. of units are built and occupied within right. eighteen within months. 18 months. Let's say that, that doesn't happen. Right. Like we we this this could take. There's significant changes here. This could take a while to get approved. Mm -hmm. Odds are we're going to fall off the Feb. As Mr. McCurdy said, we're going to fall off the February twenty first uh, deadline suddenly we are below the 10 percent but you can get right up again as when you the issue building permits the building issued. permit and you'll be good for 18, 18 months. months but he could take two years to pull his building he permits. could, he could. Sure. that's what i'm looking for is what's the window of vulnerability so costs. for two years we're open to another 40b coming in unless we have a a town no. plan remember no. now if no. i'm a developer if I'm a developer and I know you're that close, whenever I work with developers, I say, look, first thing we're going to do is check to see where a town stands on its 40B subsidized housing inventory count. And in fact, I'm doing this right now in Danvers. And I realized they were at the 10%. So I called on behalf of my client and said, look, you've met the 10%. Are you interested in at least listening to a potential new 40B project. And they said, yes, come in. Um, but any smart developer will do that. They're not going to invest all the time and money when they know the town is that close or or could be right at 10 percent. Because the t you can't do anything with the 10 percent. Okay, I'd like to move along for a minute and maybe summarize this way. We've been sitting at this for an hour and a half. Can, can you just let me summarize and then I'll let you speak. We have in front of us a substantial uh, request for modification, which involves a substantial change. We have heard some comments about what some of the concerns are with that change. We have also heard about the timetables, and we have heard whether or not um, um, the timetables can be met, should be met, or we should try to force ourselves to meet them. And it's clear that's not what you want to do. What I think what we need to do next is establish some sort of a list or some sort of a way to collect and gather those elements of this change that are worthy of further discussion and I think I'm going to pull the board to do that to see where you're at on that and then as we go through this there was a draft decision circulated for this new proposal the draft decision will highlight where it changes substantially from the initial decision. We had a draft decision committee formed for the prior approval, and I don't think it would hurt to have a subcommittee formed to start meeting on the draft decision so that we can bring back to the board the highlighted areas of where the changes are being proposed and where it's going to impact what we already approved. Could we possibly have a working session of the full for board, public work, but where nothing is being presented, where we can all sit down and talk freely with each other and look at what 
what we think about. I mean, I have a problem with the four-story buildings, but I may be the only one yeah. that has a problem with the four-story buildings. I have a problem with the four-story buildings. But, but well, I'm suggesting that we take another hour tonight to go through that initially and then continue the meeting to a time when we can do just what you're saying. Uh, just a working meeting. I don't care if the public's here. Well, they have to be here. We're, it's we're, be we're talking. Yeah, it's it would be a continuation hearing and it will be posted and the public is invited and the public comment will be invited. But yes, a working session. But what I'd like to do, again, because it's it's really relatively quiet um, on so many issues, but, but I'm hearing some real passion on some of the issues. Let's air them right now. You said there's a draft decision for this? The draft decision was presented by Attorney Levine. I don't know if it's modified since then or if you have a modification. Oh, we did. Funds worth is, it's nothing. My office, on behalf of the applicant, um, took the previous decision, and we had identified those changes that, uh, and some placeholders, many placeholders, that needed to be changed. It, it just was a working discussion document for the exact reason that Sherry indicated. So it could point out this needs to be changed. There may be other things that need to be changed, so, so you can see the scope of the changes. So who, who got this? I haven't seen it. It didn't come through the board yet. Right. So it was just Mr. Levine okay. and the applicant had started assembling it. Okay. What I think should happen is that that ought to be circulated to the board or submitted to the board. I think, as I said, we should reform the working subcommittee to make sure that when they present the changes, the working subcommittee has had a chance <coughs> to go through it with the original decision and see where that is so that we have some back and forth on that and that should happen sooner rather than later there's no reason to hold that off and then we should have a continuation of this hearing um, for the full board to continue to talk about the areas of these changes that we want to um, focus on. stress focus on and so I think tonight the presentation was made and I, I'd love to pull going around one at a time around the room and just see your initial reactions. These aren't set in stone and they're not the only reactions, but let's hear. Uh, Alan, would you mind if I started with you? Yeah, um, first thing is that I I, have, I, have a, I can't be this short. <laughs> Sorry, I can't figure out what, what, what it means. I think at some future point, uh, I'd like the applicant to go through uh, maybe the first 10 units and um, and explain across across what the X's mean. I mean, for instance, under foundation, it looks like crawl, then it's another X, and then there's, it, I just can't really understand it. So maybe going through the first 10, uh, I could then understand what the system with a chart really means, but I don't want that to happen now. Um, secondly, my concern is that um, I just want to make sure mapping, um, connecting this chart with uh, the map of the site um, to make sure that I understand where unit one actually is and unit two and so forth. Just concern that unit six, nine, ten, and twelve, and sixteen and seventeen not get clustered together. To have some assurance, have some assurance about that. Um, I also um, have a concern about the extra four feet. Um, I'd like to know more about why that is required. What, what extra four feet? Increasing variance. Increasing variance. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, variance. That's on um, top of the variance that we gave. Yeah. Um, and I think for now, those are my, my three right now. Can I just ask you, the conversion from for rent to for sale, is all right with you? Yes. Okay. Jeff? I have some questions about the chart also. Um, there is at least one that doesn't have any X under it. Um, and then there's five of these plans that I don't have a, a copy of. Um, especially this, the dessert ones, the cupcake, the short cake, and the biscotti. Um, yeah, but anyway, so though, so I'd be like a you know a complete thing. I, I think the big question for me is you know the distribution of the affordables. I'm I'm um, actually I think it'd be a great option for someone to get one of these affordables that in this present form that you're showing. Um, but I want to make sure they're not stigmatized, and I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, I have no problem with the height variance. Um, I'd like to 
you know, I would like some kind of, um, we had, we, we had taken specific buildings in the previous plan and allowed a greater height. And these buildings were at much higher elevation than these flats were. So in general, my feeling is we've lowered the overall height of the project significantly. If you could show the board that in some way, you know, if you just took a, you know, a, a, an elevation and put on, you know, in each of these buildings and then took the previous plan put, you know, where we gave you variances before, I think they would see that those roofs were probably 10 to 20 feet higher than these roofs are going to be. We can easily, easily do that. I'd also like to make the point to the board that the, the three uh, or four, four feet buys you an elevator. Without the four feet, you, you don't have four floors. I can't amortize the cost of an elevator in those buildings over three floors. And, I, and therefore, I can't serve the aging population that needs to be served. It's, it's one or the other, and, and that's just the economic reality. It's we'll get, not, I don't make up the We'll rules. get into that back and forth. I, wanna, I just want to lay and, out the concerns. And, and the, the other comment on the building of the, the uh, rental buildings, I would anticipate that the upper floors are going to have really fantastic views across Nagog and, you know, and it's a little, you know, I understand how this works. You know, these are sort of generic buildings. And it's a little disappointing to me that the site plan and the building plans don't really take that into account. Um, so that's neither here nor there, but um, it's, it's sort of an amenity that is sort of ignored in this plan. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I think my main concern is the, uh, the, the treatment of the affordables in the housing component. In the for sale component. Yes. And you're okay with the converting some to for sales? If, you know, I know these numbers are assumptions, um, but under these numbers, yes, I am okay. John, if you'll forgive me, Mr. Dennis was here earlier, and I really want to hear from you, and I think you might have left to go to planning board. Yes, it is. So can I ask you to speak before you? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, we sat down with, the, uh, with David um, uh, yesterday afternoon, and this plan is very sensible from our perspective. Obviously, the details, the devil's in the details, and we reserve the right, we'd like to reserve the right to uh, work with the engineering firm once, once the plan is finalized uh, for the a proper layout of the utilities. Um, as we said, um, to us, it's, it's, it's tight spots, and with the bedrock, um, it becomes even tighter in terms of trying to uh, fill the utilities in. And since the sewer system um, is not individuals, it, it, it's a community system, uh, we'd like to work with the developer towards trying to maximize the proper 10-foot offsets to minimize the cost. And similarly, we're going to use this unit, and we have the, the, the initial plans, and work with the fire department. We're going to sit down with our modelers and use this as a, as a test case for modeling the whole site to make sure that the fire flows to all the units meet the minimum criteria uh, so that the builder can build uh, the most affordable cost. Because, again, if you, if you go below 800 gallons a, a minute of flow, uh, the cost, um, because of the uh, proximity <coughs> of the buildings, the individual condos, the individual homes, the proximity of the buildings uh, raises the cost because of firewalls and all those things. So we're going to work with the developers consulting team and, and model the whole um, the whole subdivision when it's finalized uh, to try to make sure that we meet the 800 gallon minimum flow at every location so that it doesn't become conflictory uh, during construction. So we're going to work over the next few months once once this board approves the plans to to lay things out in an appropriate fashion. And what I heard was some change will happen to the user fees because originally it was going to be one user and they were going to collect all the water bills and then pay you, but now it'll be different users. And, and you'll work that out, but do we have to hear from you about application fees or any requests for hookup fee waivers for affordable units? Um, for the affordable units, that would be something that um, we, should, uh, we should have only the affordable units a decision on that. Um, you should, um, I'll go to my board on that because we have we have them both ways. So once the determination is made of what is affordable, how many are affordable, uh, then let us chime in on waiving of connection fees. Thank you. Okay? Thank Just on the affordables. The units, the nice thing is it's a lot cleaner now because the rentals are in buildings that are meant to be rentals. 
And so those who have one connection fee, and then it will go to the management company. The individual uh, detached condos, we'll call them for lack of a better term, um, will have individual connection fees just like in any other neighborhood, even though it's a private <laughs> subdivision. Those are the impact fees. And then we'll take an advisement uh, waiving the cost of connection fees, impact fees for the affordable units once the determination is made on how many they are and where they are. Thank you. That's unreasonable? Yes, thank you. Sherry sure, had one more comment. Yeah, Jeff, one, one more. And then if you don't mind, I'm going to skip to Ms. Hollander because she has a kid pickup. So oh, sure. Come back to Jeff. I also wanted to, um, notwithstanding the the content of, of what you showed us, your presentation this time was much, much more, it was, you know, these, these type of things are fantastic. <coughs> um, one of the reasons why we may not have gotten as much comment is because these visuals this just completely good. answer questions that are, you know, that hang over people's heads. I'd also like to say that when you look at, if you had this presentation in the previous plan with the townhouse plan, these streetscapes are infinitely much better than those would have been because those were actually quite tall buildings. Some of them were, you know, over 30 feet high. They were slab fronted. They were long. And while it's an interesting housing type from the streetscape <coughs> point of view, this is these much better. better. Thank you. Cheryl. Cheryl. Well, I can't move it before you dissolve, dissolve the meeting because then I lose, I, I can't, I would lose time here and then that counts against me as part of the meeting. No, you can catch and um, watch the tape. And then. <coughs> but then it counts as one of the times. And so I can't, so I'm going to make, yeah, it would count as one of the times. I think we're at the point where we need to go to a working meeting. I request that we dissolve the meeting within the next five, ten minutes and come back to a working meeting in, as soon as we can post one. I'm sorry, Cheryl, I can't do that. I said I was going to give it another hour to pull the entire board, and I have to do that. We're generally used to going until 10 or 11 on longer meetings, so I have to do that. Um, why don't you give your input so I have your input? Well, could we take a break so I can try to make some calls and get someone to pick her up? That's a reasonable request. Take a break. Take a five-minute break. Thank you. Does anyone need to go to the bathroom and drink?
So, you know, so we won't have because oh, that's good. So of course, so people can see. Well, it's what what it. Yes. Can you wait your turn, or you want me to skip to you? Well, you make that decision. <laughs> I agree with you. Will you remember it if I wait I to go all the way around? And he, knew, he neutralized all That's the hard part. They start talking about that. They get to that, that was a all right, I'd like to call it back to order, please. No, I'm not. As far as obviously everyone here. I don't know. I didn't talk to them. It's simply a matter of. <laughs> I'm going to show you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. Oh, those? <laughs> no, actually, oh, are I'm they? very sensitive to it because that's, I have a dozen clients that I would like to see enter the hospital. For instance, I have a very disabled family. I need one first floor bedroom. Okay, we're calling it back to order. <laughs> I mean, he may get files, he may get, you know, 3D files from um, these plans that he's able to... Um, Ms. Hollinger has found uh, alternative, alternative arrangements, so John, uh, I'll stay in order now. You're next about your comments. Thank you, though. Comments. Thank you for my break. Thank you for your patience. Um, after looking at everything, hearing everything, I, I, I like this plan better than the original plan. I'm glad the developer had the foresight to, to realize that the, the original development would not work because we don't want to be into another 40B that's going to go under. So I, I'm, I applaud him for putting the effort in, and, the, and, the, and this is a good thing, I think, in the long run because we're going to have a project that will more than likely succeed and be an asset to the town. Um, I like the individual buildings. Uh, compared to condos. Um, the four-story, as you know, I'm a fan of, but I, I could be persuaded because of the elevator situation. I'm, I'm in favor of it, and, and the <coughs> better seem to not to be opposed to it from what I've heard so far. So that I, I, don't, I don't have a problem on pretty much any of it. Thank you. Bill? Thank you. Um, couple things. Uh, we had two sets of specifications, and one is for the village apartments by the architect David White, and another is called Wildflower Meadow. Wildflower Meadow, the single-family houses, or I mean, that's not not clear in here. Um, yes. And there were some things a little bit different in each of these and whatever else, so it's something to take a look at. Also, too, we have not even touched on tonight, and I think we need to, will have to. Uh, we do have this thing about changed waivers, and you know, and changed is bolded a couple times, and I'm not sure exactly what that means, but at some point, yes, like we did with the previous project, we need to go through the whole waiver list, almost item by item, and take a look at it as we go along. Um, also, to compare to what waivers we gave before, what waivers we don't need, what waivers we still need with this list, of, in other words, some kind of oh, synchronize the two of them together. Um, I think that would be good. <coughs> That's in the draft that we tried to do, where we have the waiver list <coughs> deleted and added to it. And actually, it shrinks, I think. And, and maybe what the subcommittee can look at. Yeah, no, I'm saying yeah. But we, we, yeah. we've attempted to do that for you. But there was no mentions up to this point tonight about no, no, I agree. everything else, so I wanted to throw that out, make sure we still get the cover of everything else. <coughs> you know, I don't put my own judgment on a project, whether it, I like it or <coughs> like it, whatever else. After all we did before and everything else, it comes out as not feasible. I welcome a change to, to if this is more feasible, because again, we don't want a project that gets started and it goes to funks and it looks like a bomb hit it and, and everything else. So, you know, if this is going to be something that has a much better chance of being completed and coming out to look like you know, what's been presented, the pictures, then I'm all for it. Um, with that and everything else that, you know, from this board and from the applicants, from the voters, 
whoever, if there are comments like, I don't want this, I don't like this, everything else, I think we ought to address all these issues as to why. You know, if it's not you know, feasible, if it's not safe, if it's you know, whatever else, and you know, the fire department's going to have to weigh in on the four stories or the 53 feet high because I think they're one of the prime players in that decision. You know, the building codes are rest and everything else based on uh, fire prevention and fire protection. Um, closeness of buildings and everything else. So I'd be very interested in seeing a lot of comments from the, the fire department. Also, too, and Mr. Bernier and the fire department working with Mr. Hill, the architects, and everybody else, even now with preliminary specs, preliminary designs, whatever else, let's make sure that there aren't going to be hang-ups later on so that when and if we get to the point of approving this project, then it's not going to be a two-year gap and they have to get a building permit application. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody realizes there is something missing or something that hasn't been looked at. So I think even now, now would be a good time to, to start some, to keep, if there have been some discussion, keep it going. If there hasn't, there should be, you know, to help keep that going on the same um, track as what we are. Good comments. Cheryl. I think that the abutter is probably, I think that the fact that the Part A and Part B have gone to single-family detached condos can only improve the abutter's situation um, and resale and the impact on their properties. And I have absolutely no problem with those going to ownership. Ownership condominium complexes tend to be much better kept, tend to be much better run, and tend to maintain values more and thus will be beneficial, Bill, I'm trying to give you my reasons, beneficial to the butters. The rental part, I do have, but I do have concerns about placement and amenities of the affordable units in that part. Um, and I think we need to address that. On the part C, the rental part, we went through a lot of, of changes and negotiation that a lot of this started with these four-story buildings. I guess, can I interrupt myself with a quick question, Mr. Marchant? You do a lot of 40Bs, both from both angles. Is it true that you can't feasi economically feasibly have an elevator for less than a four-story building? Do you see ec elevators in buildings that are only three stories? Uh, nothing, absolutely. I've, I've seen elevators in three-story buildings. Uh, uh, four-story buildings are more economical. It's Not awesome. only for the elevator, but for other reasons. I think the applicant also stated that the the, the building costs necessary to amortize the cost of an elevator with today's uh, code compliance. I'm questioning. I'm question, I guess I'm questioning his statement. If that is it true, that is just econ not economically feasible. I mean, that's that's like saying it's not economically feasible to build a septic um, uh, sewage system it, it, for it, less than 200 to, units. You, you have to look at everything. So you can't say it's it's not feasible. There are three-story buildings that are built with elevators. But in general, when you take a look at the common costs, the roof, the foundations, you get to amortize it over one additional floor. Um, mm -hmm. That begins to affect your per unit cost. One of the, I think, one of the items when, when you get to me, you last for is a copy of a pro forma. There, there, there are no pro formas right now for the rental or the or the for sale, and that's something the board should ask for. And you'll be reviewing it for us I, in only the most general way. Okay. Because that's not you don't really Just, review a pro forma in detail until and unless you're concerned that some of the conditions you're asking for could make the project uneconomic. Keep going. Okay. So my concerns are with the height of the building. We had an abutters from the daycare come in, and when this building was originally put here, they were reassured that they were going to be a much lower, much smaller building that would have less of an impact on their business. 
now that building's back. I don't know if they've been notified at all or given an opportunity to. We've met with them. Um, and I don't, and my I have an issue with 53 foot tie buildings. Okay. Next. Okay, as far as negative. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I wasn't sure she was done. Next. Next comment, if you have any others. No. Oh, okay. rental rental in perpetuity. Are we talking? I, I'm not sure I understand what they're proposing. Are we talking about having the rental units um, FC be rental in perpetuity? One buildings one and two will remain rental in perpetuity. Building three, they want the option of being able to convert it if the market demands it, if the finances demand it, or what have you. But the numbers that they presented to us would keep us under the host community agreement with sufficient units to keep us, uh, based on the assumptions that were made, safe until 2030. I have a problem with those assumptions, but watching the growth rate in the last six months in Littleton to say that we're only going to have 450 additional units in the next 10 years just doesn't... I, doesn't ideally, that would be shame on, shame on the projections we made, but ideally, that's plenty of time. For, we're good till 2020 anyway, that's plenty of time to get the housing production plan in place, right, Keith? Okay. That, that's All right, so right. I guess... We're, we have obligations to work on affordable housing as, as a town in right. any event. In my opinion, if we end up with four-story buildings, then I think they should at least all three of them be rent in perpetuity. Okay. And... Perpetual. How come I can't say that? Perpetuity. Perpetuity. Thank you. Rod. Okay, as far as negative impacts to the town, I don't think there's going to be any difference between the two proposals, so that doesn't bother me any. Um, it was already mentioned that the buildings near the Grist Middle residence are going to be lower, and that's a benefit. The tall buildings are close to Nagog Park, so it just, again won't have that much of a negative impact, I don't believe, in the Grist Mill people. As far as building height goes, four feet out of 50 feet. To me, that's insignificant, and it's not even worth really having that much of a debate. Secondly, there's a big benefit. Four stories versus three stories decreases the footprint substantially and, and you know, gives you a little more green space and less impervious surface. So I think that's a positive. Thank you. I want to talk more about it in the working yeah. session. Mm -hmm. I could be convinced. Yeah, you're talking eight, but eight, I, eight I, 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 want, I want us to be able to have a discussion. Yeah. Right. Thank you. You done? Yeah. Oh, and one other thing. I don't like the idea of giving them the option of going uh, for sale in, in building three, because if they do, we potentially in 2020 are going to be just over 10 percent, and a few extra homes could drop us under 10 percent. What I'd rather do is see that have them come back in the future if they want to uh, make the change, and then we'll decide at that time if it's appropriate. Just to be clear, it would be a substantial change to go from rental to ownership, and we would have that opportunity in any event. They have to come back. <coughs> so we don't have to put a perpetuity condition on it. We get it in any event. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have the Do we have the arm arm strength though? The arm wrestle strength. If we don't put the clause in, it will be the board then. I don't know if we'll all still be here in 2020. I, I <laughs> hope not. Quite frankly, <laughs> the board then that will have, have served my time. Flex its muscle, <laughs> Mr. Sauce. Here, it's your turn. Uh, overall, uh, I like this plan better than the previous one. It does have more ownership in it, or has ownership in it. I think hopefully it'll attract people that um, you know will be like us who want to help out in the town and have more volunteers for some of these boards um, which are less likely to do with uh, with people who are renting or more transient nature um, yeah overall the overall height of the project goes down another four feet on those large buildings um, especially from what I understand it has more to do with the roof line than anything else so I don't really have a big problem with that um, yeah discuss a little further uh, the option to turn building three from rental to ownership. Um, not totally clear on the uh, ramifications of that, but overall I don't uh, see any large objections to that. As far as the site home options, I think it's pretty straightforward. What is a little confusing, I think, is some of your tabs put X's in the wrong over, so it might be confusing to some people, but it, it seems pretty straightforward to me. I could have done a better job of explaining it, and uh, we did put it together. 
quickly. So I apologize for that. Um, as far as being controversial, I'd like to apologize for the accusations that you wasted our time. Um, I think we wasted a lot of your time with some of the things that we agonized over in previous meetings. Um, I think if we keep our eye on the bigger picture, as opposed to the location of a fence or two trees versus one, the, new, the next process will go a lot faster. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Mark. Mr. Joyce, you asked me to recognize you. Okay. <laughs> Cities and towns all over the country are tearing down these high-rise, uh, low-rent houses in favor of garden-style apartments. I have a problem with the with the uh, with the uh, high-rise building, this four-story. I'm also re I read the crime statistics in the Lowell Sun every day, and I never see problems with the Littleton uh, population. We live in a safe town. I'd like it to stay that way. If we uh, allow people to in, uh, to uh, rent in a four-room apartment. Are we going to get uh, quality uh, tenants? Littleton is a safe town. I want it to stay that way, and I'm I'm against a four four-story building. I think three is the maximum, and let us concentrate on uh, garden style apartments. I, I will just comment that we were at a meeting to discuss the chief, uh, police chief's uh, functions going forward and the need for additional officers, etc. And if I'm not mistaken, Keith, he had some statistics of how many trips are likely to be generated by the that many for rent units coming online. So we'll get that comment, yeah, I think, from yeah, the police we, we chief. Do, we do have those statistics, and, and but they were based on 190 rental units. Right. So we can maybe extrapolate from there, Patrick. Yeah. Those are good comments. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bill? If I one one other thing that I wanted to get to earlier and then didn't quite get there. Um, Deep or sale? Will they be restricted, or maybe we need a discussion on being restricted to owner occupied, so that oh, they can be sold and then them? rented? The the, the uh, that issue is covered in the regulatory agreement, and it's the standard uh, mass housing regulatory agreement for for sale units that all of the agencies use. I, so I think does. that applies only to the affordable units. Though. So you're asking, are all yeah. the units, all the owners all the for sale He's asking to about be, all. All the for sale to be restricted to an owner occupied. Mm -hmm. I don't think we will agree to that. Okay, well, the part of the, I don't think you can uh, bring it up as a discussion that we may want to get to later on and resolve. Because right now, everybody keeps saying the for sale and presuming. Nobody could get Nine members here probably got nine different presumptions. I think your protection on that is these, the price of them high enough that renting them is not a very practical alternative. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've got no, houses for rented you, right now for $3,000. How can account. you practically prevent a rental if someone is relocated for three years or whatever? <clears throat> so no, one, no buyer would be able to get a loan. Yeah, I understand that, but we're not going there. That was just a comment, and we're adding it to the yeah. list of comments. Okay, I've gone around the board with comments. Now, Mr. Marchant, you wanted to I'll be comment only in terms of, I think, additional information the board might want. Uh, I looked quickly at the landscape plan. I, I didn't see uh, indication of sizes of tree or plant material or quantities. Uh, you normally ask for species, sizes, and quantities, and planting details. The comprehensive permit itself that was issued for the current project uh, was a rental project. The minute you introduce for sale, you will need a number of additional conditions related to for sale. Uh, the dessert models, I think we all need, or the board needs, uh, printouts of those plans. I've already mentioned that I think the board should ask for a pro forma. Uh, normally, you would have the benefit of a pro forma because it's a requirement for the Pell application. Here, and I agree with uh, David Hale, 
Mass Housing doesn't want to be in the business of having to issue Pels with each change in a project. They will go through an extremely thorough and time-consuming, unfortunately, uh, review in order to grant final approval. Uh, they will review a pro forma at that stage, but I think you should have one now, and I think it's entirely appropriate for you to ask for one. I have some minor uh, technical issues with the calculation of the affordable unit, but those are technical issues, and I can just speak with the applicant directly on that. That's it. Um, Council. And just one comment. <clears throat> I believe that the conversion of Unit 3, they're looking for uh, the ability to do it without coming back to the board so that it's written into this, the decision that they can go take it out of its its rental state. Oh, so we wouldn't have an opportunity so, so to address the, it the way it's written. It's, if it's written the way you're looking, that's right, right? You're looking Th that, is our, that is our proposal, and it's, it's driven by local investors who would like to see that. that in, in, was there a time frame? Was it, was it, could it be immediate or was there a time period after which it would be allowed? You know, I just flipped through and I couldn't find there's it. No there. In, there was no time. There was no draft. There's no time. Though. Could be exercised at any time. So something for your subgroup to consider. Consider, or the whole group to consider. It's just I've got it on my list of things. Oh, well, yeah. one more comment. Um, I don't know if there's a need for peer review, but if there is, you should discuss that sooner rather than later. My reaction to this proposal, and I've made the notes already, is that we already got traffic. We got a letter from traffic. I, I guess I should have read it in the record, but it wasn't here today. We'll read it at the next meeting. Letter from traffic where they said the traffic plan improves, doesn't get worse. There's a little, there's a, a very few more traffic trips per day at a little different hours when you have ownership versus rental. And um, offline, I asked Chief Kelly to comment on that. I will ask him to put it, something in writing on that, that he agreed with that traffic plan. So I didn't see need for traffic consultant peer review. And I've already asked the applicant to make sure that he does the drainage calculations, because they will change with the surface, the roof runoff, and the road changes. Um, he's assured me that the crossing, the wetlands crossing, doesn't change, and that um, they'll have the letter from our consultant showing that those changes aren't going to be significant. So I really think we're pretty much down to the drainage calculations is the only place where we might want to have. Um, I, I also think they improved, by the way, but I want the consultant to say that. So what we've suggested is that the building permit be conditioned on a letter from the uh, uh, peer review uh, graves saying that the drainage complies with stormwater, uh, et cetera. So we're giving him a plan that's that's approved, and he's he's working on a real plan. And, and, and in terms of if we have any chance of meeting any deadlines, and that's the only holdup, I've been told that that's perfectly permissible. OK. Um, can you let me just finish going around the room? So Tom, Chris, I imagine you don't have ind independent comment, or, or do you want to? Okay, Roland, you're still. I'm all set so far. Uh, Keith, you have anything? No. And um, let's see, who else is still here? Everyone else left. So I guess we're around the room on comments. Um, would the applicant like to respond? And then I'm going to try to wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a couple things. We did we did uh, bring a pro forma to pass out to the board. Well, let's do that now, so we'll have it for the next meeting. Do you mind? Um, is that for the for sale units, or is that for the for just for the for sale units? It's great. And it's you know it's a uh, you know it's a it's a very general pro forma. We don't have a crystal ball as to um, you know which models we've chosen, what size they'll be, what the will be. Uh, so this is, this is, I guess. Well, your timing is good because the market in Littleton has picked up dramatically in the last eight or nine months. Um, it seems like it. I've been through enough of these cycles to realize that it's always a cycle. The Fed stops tapering. And, uh, who knows? If I may, 
Rather than have you respond, I pulled for your benefit so you could hear what the concerns were, and for my benefit so I could see how much, how many areas of disagreement we seem to have at the table today. And I'm satisfied that the issues are fairly narrow for us to plan another meeting in short order. I would like to propose a continuation to next week. Um, you would be prepared to respond to sure. some of the things. As you heard, each member's singular opinion doesn't reflect the opinion of the many members. And as they were discussing on this side, maybe the height, maybe those who are opposed to the height could be convinced by other board members rather than by you uh, um, of, a, of a feeling toward the height. So rather than belabor this any longer, it's getting on 10 o'clock. And I know Mr. Bernie has got a long ride home. Um, could, could I make one? Yes, absolutely. Just one suggestion, um, which is that um, as you look at the chart, which I did a really bad job of explaining, um, what I'd like to say is that uh, where it says uh, crawl space, walk out, whatever, our spec and what we presented to um, Mass Housing was that the spec is for a slab on grade unit. That everyone gets a slab on grade unit unless they choose an option. We, we are in an improving housing market, but it is a very competitive situation, and people are going to stretch to buy these houses. So some people are going to say, you know what, I don't want to pay for that. And some people, same thing with a the garage. They may say, I'm, I want this, this, this lot because I can put a garage on later. I can't afford it today. So that list is to be viewed in terms of what the basic spec is and everything else on there basements, garages, all those things will be options and they'll be options at a specified price that will allow us to tailor the project to meet the market needs. What you heard loud and clear from this board is that at some level they don't want the affordable homes to be singled out from the street so that someone can drive by and say those are affordables and they didn't get anything new with the market. We agree with that. You heard that loud yep. and clear. I probably did you a disservice by not letting you explain the chart because it wasn't legible and I thought we would bog down in it. But every member of the board has made a comment about where you're going to put your affordables, what they're going to look like, and what amenities they're going to have compared to the markets. You need to go home and hear that and do something to convince the board about that. On every other subject, generally the board was favorable. There is some four-story height restriction disagreement among board members. and. I think that all the comments are reasonable. And there's um, really not a whole lot of other concerns um, going on here. So like I said, I'd like to make a continuation hearing for next week. <coughs> that would have been a regular meeting night anyway, so I trust that all board members will be available and we're not too close to the Christmas holidays to say that there's an inability to make it. I was hoping we did it. I know, I know. The, the good news is we have no other hearings, right? So it would just be this. Hopefully it'll be a shorter meeting. Can we do 7.30 again? So we can do 7.30 again. And I'll make sure my daughter has a ride. And before we actually set that continuance in concrete, I would also like to see if the board agrees that the subcommittee to work on the decision ought to be the same subcommittee that worked before. And if I have my subcommittee I think you should, members I think willing. you should let us have the working meeting first. So so that we know what we're working on for a decision. It doesn't matter because the subcommittee is not going to work on the decision. The subcommittee is going to meet to see if the draft um, decision contains all of the issues and, and where they might come back to the board at the working session and say these things are in the draft. Nobody's going to work on the, on the final decision yet. We're just going to get it ready. So do you want a motion that you have the same subcommittee members? Yeah, I think I, if my same subcommittee is available, was it you and uh, Jeff and myself? No, I think it was just you and I. No, I just Jeff, you. weren't you with us? No, he was on the. I was on the. Uh, uh, so it was just faded, going myself. Faded, yeah. 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 Well, we need Bill. We need Bill for his attention to order. <laughs> He's very good about putting things in order, and I'm not detail in order. So, yes, I'd like. I'll take a motion. I make a motion that we form a subcommittee to review the proposed, um, call it final decision, is that what we're calling it? 
review the proposed final decision draft decision. draft decision and report back to the board on the changes and details proposed and I propose that that committee be formed of Sherry Gould and Bill Farnsworth any second to that I'll second all those in favor Aye. Aye. did you get all that Michelle any opposed Okay. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is to have a um, notice posted to continue the hearing. Bill, pick a date and time certain, please. Next Thursday. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is the date? 1919. And location. Continue to this point. Are you going to move it? I do need to make a motion to do it. A motion to continue this hearing to December 19, 2013 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, in this building, probably this room, if not, it will be posted on the door if we need to change rooms. Second. To that motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Um, I just want to comment whether you can reach out to the departments and boards to see if they want to make any comments by that night. Sure. Sure. Do you know when you're going to, the subcommittee is going to meet or are you going to meet, are we going to meet before next Thursday? Yeah, if you stay a minute, the subcommittee will pick a time and a place to meet. We don't need to post that because I'm not sure what's right. We need to post it. What, a subcommittee? Yeah, so we'll talk for a minute and decide that. Um, anyone else? How about a motion? Motion to adjourn, 10 o'clock. All in favor. Uh, second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.